missed for a little bit. Shame. Hi, everyone. Hello, sir. How are you doing? Hello. Hi. So who is in the guest house Mama, can you hear me? Yes, Walter, I can hear you. OK. Five seconds. We are ready. OK. All right. So hello, everyone. Welcome to our Rio analysis class of the diploma program. This is 2020. So I'm teaching to an empty lecture room for just uh, maybe one more week. I hope you will be here very soon. So who is in the guest house now? Raise your hands if you students are here. OK, one, two, three. OK, the other ones are with no video. I will learn. OK, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you virtually in the first moment, but I hope to welcome you here very soon. So this is going to be our, our real analysis class of uh, 2020. Can you all read this size of my hand, my writing? Is that OK? Yeah, that, it's OK. OK. So this is going to be real analysis. Uh, I am going to be your instructor. So my name is Emmanuel Carneiro. I am from Brazil. As many of you here, I'm not uh, from Italy. I'm from Brazil. Uh, I came here to ICTP. I arrived here a couple of years ago. Uh, and this is the first time I am going to be teaching this course. So this course will have 15 lectures. We start today. Our tutor will be uh, Miss Andrea Olivo. She is from Argentina. She is a, she is a new postdoc here. She has not yet arrived. As many of you, she's still dealing with the whole process of getting visa, getting flights, uh, spending some time in quarantine when she arrives. So she's expected to arrive sometime in October. And of course, meanwhile, she will be giving you the tutorials online. Okay, So you will meet with her uh, online, I guess, in a time to be set up, maybe every Friday. We'll check that later. OK, so this is the scheme, the courses I told you. It's going to be 15 lectures. Now, let me tell you briefly before we start uh, a few words of what I imagine for this course. Okay, so essentially the the basic references that I would like to point out to you for this course would be the following books. Okay, so. Let's see, if you have never seen uh, measure theory in your life, maybe this, this, this book by Barto is the, the easiest one. Robert Barto, the title of the book is here. Elements uh, of Integration. And then there are the classical books that I like very much. The one by Folland. Of course, the one by Stein and Shakarshi. And the one by uh, Zygmunt. Whedon and Zygmunt, let's see. Let me get the full names of the books here for you. Okay. Fallon's book is called Real Analysis.
uh, Stein's and Shakarshi's book is called also Real Analysis, Measure Theory and Integration. Uh, and Zygmunt's and Whedon's books is called Measure and Integration. So I think with these four books in mind, we can have a very good chat, okay? Uh, again, the first one is, I think, the easiest introduction to the theory of measure, measure theory, and integration, okay? These three others are more interesting for someone who has maybe already, has already seen a little bit of measure theory and integration and wants to develop more. Uh, on the subject, okay? But it would be nice if you do a little bit of poopoo and uh, read something from one, read something from the other. I'm gonna try to be releasing to you some handouts, some lecture notes, and so on. And uh, of course, we will be discussing here in the class and in the tutorials over the next uh, two months, okay? So the plan, as I told you, the plan is to have 15 lectures starting today, okay? And of course, uh, for you students, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Let's divide the course uh, as for your grades. We are going to have, let's say, 25% of homework, uh, let's say 25% of our midterm exam, and 25% of the final, 50% of our final exam. Okay, we plan to do a midterm exam and a final exam, and we're going to be doing some homeworks over every week. Now, what do I expect from you? Now let me tell you how this course is going to be better for you and what you should do. Okay, so what is the required, say, background that I would like you to have. Uh, the ideal thing would be for you to have a solid, say, background in calculus. When I say calculus, I say also not only the, you know, memorization of uh, limits, uh, the derivatives, the integral, but also, you know, limits, uh, derivative, integral, not only memorizing, you know, that the derivative of x squared is 2x and so on, but knowing what the derivative is, what the Riemann integral is in terms of epsilons and deltas, having been a little bit exposed and has been used to these arguments of, of uh, give me an epsilon, I'll find a delta such that this holds and so on, to define the limit, to define the derivative. So when I say good background in calculus, uh, I want also you to understand the several operations that we are going to do with sequences, you know, and convergence uh, issues. For you to remember what's the limit of a sequence, you know, these concepts of limit, uh, soup, inf, uh, lim soup, lim inf, you know, all of these things we'll be using all the time here. And also it would be nice for you to have some basic topology. You will be having the class of basic topology here as well, but if it's good if you already remember, at least in the Euclidean space, you know, what's an open set, what's a closed set, what's a compact set, and so on. And okay, maybe ideally you also should have seen some, perhaps some basic measure theory. We are going to start by reviewing the basic objects in measure theory. That's my plan at least. But I, my feeling is that this course will be most profitable if you have already some of this background with you. Some calculus, some epsilons and delta arguments, some, say, analysis on the real line. You are good with the operations with sequences, understand convergence, lim, lim, sup, lim, inf, understand what are 
basic open closed sets and compact sets and the basic theorems about this. And ideally you have probably you may have already seen some, some measure theory in your life. You know, what's a measurable set, what's a measure, what's a measurable function, the definition of the integral, and so on. We are going to start reviewing this. But it would be good if you already know. Now, Professor, I don't know any of these things. You're all talking uh, crazy things. To me, I came from a bachelor in psychology, and now I decided to do mathematics. I have never seen anything like this before. This course will not be for you. No, that's not true. I mean, my aim here is that everybody gets something from the course, OK? So uh, what I want to do is to, you know, to take you from point A to point A plus B, where B is something positive, you know. And now everybody has their own starting point A, but I wanted to take you something forward. Now, as I'm saying, it's going to be most profitable if you are somewhere in this range and you work very hard. So I really want you to work hard for this course. Work hard means I know that you will be having other course simultaneously with this one. Maybe not for the first week, so really use these first weeks when I am alone here to take a look at some of this material. Uh, and I really want you to study, you know, good, solid four hours a day for this course, you know. Let's, I, I know you have other courses, but if you could study, say, four hours a day for this course, I think it would be ideal for the next two months. You have to work serious because what I do here on the board what I, I write on the notes, what you see on the books, it's really just 20 or 30 percent of your learning process. You know? To me, I believe that the learning process really occurs when you sit down and you try to do the proofs yourself, you try to solve the exercises. I put a lot of emphasis in the homework. We are going to discuss the homework later, maybe in the tutorial, how I would like you to approach the homeworks, but really, I'm not a guy of assigning, you know, 35, homework, 35 easy homework problems for you. No, I, am, I want to assign to you seven, eight, but good ones that you have to think about and earn each of the problems. And I would like you to write your solutions very nicely and keep this material for you. This is the only way that you're going to do and take the best that you can from this course. Are we understood? Is that okay? Please, yes, okay. please, do you have, do you guys have questions? Are we good? Okay, so let's start, okay? Let's, let's start with our lecture number one. This lecture will be what I'm, let's say basic concepts of measure theory. Now, let me briefly describe what I want to do with you in these 15 lectures. I already sent uh, some emails to you saying what I wanted to do. But what I want to do is to start in the first few lectures with a review of uh, measure theory, uh, the basic and abstract constructions of sigma algebras, measurable functions, measures, integral, the convergence theorems, monotone convergence, the dominated convergence, Fatou's lemma. Okay. Once we know this abstract setting, I will move a little bit to define the Lebesgue measure. Okay, we will spend some lectures on this. And then we'll come back and study a little bit more about say LP spaces, uh, properties about uh, duality on LP spaces, the composition of measures, theorems like uh, radon nicodemus theorem. And maybe if time allows it in the end, see a little bit of convolutions, approximations of the identity, Fourier transform, and other nice things, okay? Uh, but let's see, okay. So, first, I wanted to, let's say, in this class, to review with you some of the basic concepts of measure theory. 
uh, in, in, in a relatively abstract way, you know? I am going to tell you why we are going to do this. Okay, so, so, so measure theory is born, at least to me, by this, this ancient idea that the mathematicians or the scientists of the past had this, this ambitious idea to measure the volume of things in our space, you know, measure the volume, measure the surface. And this, this seem, seems to be a simple problem, but it's not. It's actually a very hard problem, and the tools have been developed over the years. How to put this in a, say, in a mathematically robust framework, you know? And it turns out that it's best seen if you forget about the Euclidean space for a moment and try to make an abstract theory where you have sets, where you have some sets that you want to measure, and you explain to me how you are going to measure those sets. Okay? So for now, if you like games, this is going to be like a game that I'm going to give you a set of rules of the game, and you are just allowed to move according to those rules. You know? This is actually the, one of the principles of mathematical thinking. You know? that I give you a certain set of rules or a certain set of axioms, and I tell you, you're allowed to do to use these rules to prove this thing, you know? And this is what you want to do. Some people have, some people who are coming to mathematics now, you know, they have a little bit of trouble to adjust to this mathematical thinking. But it takes some time, but once you get it, I mean, you can really enjoy the power of things. So for now, okay, so let me see what I want to do. I got some notes here that I will, uh, Give to you later. Okay, so now let's start with the definition of recalling what a sigma algebra is. And here the point is I will call let omega be a set. So give me any set. I'm going to call it omega. And I'm going to take a family of subsets, so A, non-empty family uh, let's call it sigma of subsets of omega is called Sigma algebra. You can write sigma with the Greek letter sigma here. Sigma algebra, if it is closed under two operations, complements and countable unions. That is, meaning if a set A belongs to this collection sigma, then the complement of A, which we will generally denote A complement, which is the same as the set omega minus A, belongs to the family as well. Okay? Uh, so we may denote complement by a complement omega minus a or omega minus a, like this. Okay, so you just choose your favorite notation, whatever you prefer. Uh, two, uh, let's say, if you take countable union, let's say countable union. of sets in omega belong to omega. So this is what I was referring to. I'm going to give you just a set of rules. These are my rules, and we're going to play with this. So this is the definition of a sigma algebra. It's just a collection. You give me a set, your favorite set, and, uh, and uh, I'm just 
going to take a collection of subsets that verifies the following properties. This collection that I'm going to take is going to be closed under complements and countable unions, meaning that if a set A is in the collection, then the complement is in the collection. And if I take a set uh, countable, could be finite or infinite, you know, if I take, uh, say, a sequence a n, uh, say a n bigger than one contained in the collection, this actually implies that the union of these guys, so this is what it, what it means, uh, also is a, an element in the collection sigma. OK, so this is what the sigma algebra is. And sigma is usually used in this context because this is the Greek letter used to denote some sort of sum, you know, uh, which is embedded in this condition too. If you take unions, if you add up sets, if you take unions of sets in this collection, you should remain in the collection. So let's try to give you some examples of this. Uh, so one thing uh, that you will see in many books, maybe before we move to the examples, that uh, note to you is that uh, sometimes you will say in the books the definition that uh, the empty set and the whole set should be in the sigma algebra. Well, I am implicitly saying this here. When I say that my collection is uh, non-empty, when I say that my collection is non-empty, I am saying that there exists a set in the sigma algebra, A. Okay? And uh, so if the set is in the sigma algebra, the set A complement is in the sigma algebra as well. And the intersection of sets is in the sigma algebra as well. The intersection is here. Or maybe, if you want, the union is in the sigma algebra. gives the whole omega. And then uh, the omega belongs to the sigma algebra. And the omega complement, which is the empty set, also belongs to the sigma algebra. So I don't have to say that the empty set and the whole set are in the sigma algebra because they already are. Now, it is going to be useful to remember, so this is note number one. Note number two, it will be very convenient to remember these uh, this, uh, rules of, uh, of set theory. You should be comfortable with these arguments. Sometimes they're called De Morgan's laws in set theory, which is essentially just to say that if you take a union of sets, and then you take the complement. This is just the intersection of the complements. OK? Um, now, with a property like this, uh, so for example, if you wanted to apply this uh, with uh, so this, this actually, if you wanted to apply this with the union of the a n complements, complements. So this is going to be just the intersections of your a n's. Okay. So if you get a sequence of a n's that is in your sigma algebra, what I'm trying to say is that not only the countable union of these guys is in the sigma algebra, but also the countable intersection. So this belongs to the sigma algebra. Uh, why is that? Well, if each a n is in my sigma algebra, then the complement is, then the union of these guys is, and then the complement of this whole thing is, which is this guy. OK? So there's no problem in saying, well, from the definition, you get that the intersection of countable, you, you can do also intersection. So you're free, essentially, with just these two definitions, you keep developing your machinery, and you're essentially free to take complements, unions, or intersections in any countable way that you want. Okay? And everybody will still belong to this sigma algebra. Let's, let's, let's talk about some examples. By the way, feel free to interrupt me at any time. All right. Now, examples. Uh, well, let's see. 
Two very basic and not interesting examples are if you want to take just the sigma algebra to be the empty set and the whole set. This is an example of a sigma algebra. You just take the empty set and the whole full set omega, right? If you take intersections of these guys, you get this. If you take union, you get this, and that's it. So this is the, the most trivial and the most non-interesting example that you can think of. Of course, another example is that if you take the sigma algebra containing everybody, let's say the P of omega is the set of all subsets of omega. So sometimes it's denoted by P of omega, sometimes it's denoted by 2 to the omega. So it's just, you may have seen this notation in your life. It's the set of all subsets. It's the collection of all subsets. Well, if you were taking all subsets in the sigma algebra, of course, everybody, everything here is verified. Uh, now, you may think of others, other things, you know. Uh, let's see. You may quickly come up with some more sophisticated examples. For instance, barrel sets hmm? in real line. Barrel sets, barrel. Borel sets, yes. Yeah, in real line. I will talk about the borel sets in two seconds. But let me, let's say, before we do the borel sets, let's just take a very Simple example on a way to think about this, okay? So suppose your set omega is just uh, made of five numbers, one, two, three, four, and five, okay? And you want to construct a sigma algebra. And I'm telling you that your sigma algebra, I am going to put some sets there. I'm going to say that the sets, uh, the empty set will be there, the set one will be there, the set two, four will be there, and the set one, two, three, four, five will be there. Let's just pick, let's just pick four numbers. Okay. Just take four numbers. So my, my my set omega is one, two, three, four, and I'm, I'm I want a sigma algebra that such that these four sets are there. And I ask you, can you construct the smallest sigma algebra, the smallest collection of sets that verifies? our axioms here that contain these four sets that I'm giving you. Uh, well, and then you can start to build up from what you already have. Okay, so let's just try to take complements, you know. So if this is my initial set, my initial collection of sets in my sigma algebra, and I have the, the, the collection has to be closed under complements and countable unions, so I may take, uh, well, the complement of this guy is this one. It's already there. The complement of one has to be in the collection. The complement of one is, so I have to put the set two, three, four, which is the complement of one. Now, the complement of two, four is also a set that has to be in the collection. So it's the set one, three. OK, so now I, got, I put the complement of this guy, and I put the complement of this guy. What else? Unions. Unions of these guys have to be in the collection. So the union of 1, 2, and 4 is the set 1, 2, and 4. It has to be in the collection, too. The union of this with the whole thing is the whole thing. The union of this with the whole thing is the whole thing. So I'm fine. I put the unions of these guys. The union of these two uh, is 1, 2, 3, 4 is already there. Maybe the union of these two, well, then I'm okay. How about uh, some intersections? Uh, we need the complement of the last set. The complement of the second line, right? Of the, no, the third oh, line. The complement of this guy, yeah. So the complement of this guy has to be in the sigma algebra. So the, the element three itself has to be in the sigma algebra. And then I believe we are okay with this. I believe this forms the smallest sigma algebra that contains this initial set that we gave here, x. Now you can check that the, if I take this as my whole collection of these eight sets here, of the 16 possible sets, I think you will be fine and prove that every 
complement is there, and countable unions of guys is also there. Okay, please verify to me. I think we are okay. Okay, so this is something that you can do. You can start yourself with some collection of sets, and you can ask yourself, what's the smallest sigma algebra that contains that collection that I'm giving you a priori? And you can somehow complete it to what you want. You may end up getting the whole thing, the whole set of subsets, but not, sometimes not. Okay. For example, you may play, ar play around, perhaps, with this example here. So I'm going to take a sigma algebra of sets, of, of sets, say, in the real line. Okay, so let's just take omega to be the real line. And I'm going to declare my, my sigma algebra as the sets, say, x, such that either x is countable or x complement is countable. So either x is countable or its complement is countable. Verify to me or not if this is a sigma algebra. Is this a sigma algebra? Okay. And then you can go on. You can move on to more and more sophisticated examples. The Borel sets, okay? The Borel sets, as, as you guys mentioned, is just the, the Borel sigma algebra, let's say in Rd, you are in the Euclidean space Rd, is just the smallest sigma algebra that contains all the open sets of Rd. Wow, teacher. How is that so cool? This is the same construction as we did right here. Well, just a little bit more sophisticated, right? So you take, you are in the Euclidean space, R, R2, R3, the Rd if you want. And you know there are open sets there, okay? And you ask yourself for, okay, I want all the open sets to be my sigma algebra. What's the smallest sigma algebra that contains all of these open sets? Well, this is called the Borel sigma algebra in Rd. Maybe I should leave this to you as a very insightful exercise to prove that such a thing always exists, okay? So this is going to be your exercise one of the homework this week. Let's see. Exercise one. Let's see. If, let's generalize what we did there. If x is any collection of sets in omega, then there exists a smallest sigma algebra that contains x. I put here a smallest in quotes because I want to further explain. What's the smallest sigma algebra that contains x? It's in the sense that <laughs> if a sigma algebra contains x, then it's going to contain this smallest sigma algebra that contains x. In the sense that, uh, let's say, i.e., uh, as a matter of fact, you're going to show that... Uh, that Yet intersection, all of sigma algebras that contains x. Exactly. So, oh, so in the sense, what you have to prove is that the intersection of all the sigma algebras, sigma, such that x 
is contained in sigma. So you define this as, I don't know, uh, y. So define this as y. You have to show that y is a sigma algebra. Show that the intersection of all the sigma algebras that contain your set X is still a sigma algebra. And this is the smallest sigma algebra that contains uh, your set, the definition itself. So you see that the, the whole set theory, the, the arguments, can get uh, sophisticated very quickly. Okay? So think about, think about this property here. Uh, uh, of course, this intersection is non-empty because, why? There is a sigma algebra that contains the collection X. And the sigma algebra that contains it, it's the, the sigma algebra of the, all the subsets. So you already have somebody here to intersect. So but let, if you take the intersection of all the sigma algebras, then you have to prove that this is still a sigma algebra. And, uh, well, and you can, with this exercise in hand, once you have proved this exercise, you can surely say that there is a smallest sigma algebra that contains the open sets in RD. There exists. You probably don't know yet how to identify it properly, but you know it exists. This is some of the magic of mathematics. Sometimes you can prove things exist without exactly knowing what it is. Okay? But we are going to, to think a little bit more if you want to adapt this to the... Just a remark, okay? Can you think? Can you think of describing the Borel sigma algebra? Um, professor, tell me. Um, what if we start with X and uh, do all? Uh, carry out all the rules that we have with us to construct uh, countable unions of uh, sets in X and uh, include all the co complements as well, then we'll essentially get the sigma algebra that we that is uh, generated by X, right? Okay, let me see if I understood your question. Uh, you want to start with the open sets here? and uh, take uh, complements, which are the closed sets, and you take countable unions of these guys? Is that what you are suggesting? Yes. Yes, we have to do this, right? But uh, as we have seen from this very basic example, we took the complements and made a second line here. And still, we had to take unions of these guys, and we made a third line. And then we have to make sure that all the complements, the, the complements of the new guys are there. And then we had to come up with more guys, you know? This process is, you are right, you have to do this to start, but you will quickly realize when you try to do it that you have to do it many times. Because once, whenever you do, whenever you introduce new guys in the sigma algebra, there will be newer guys that have to be introduced. And you have to think about how to formalize this thing, you know? This is not a very simple description. This is a hard thing to do. You can look at the, the internet if you want or take a look at the books. But uh, this, is a, this is an exercise you guys can do right now. You can think about and you can actually prove the existence of the smallest sigma algebra and you can convince that this thing here exists. And, uh, and we're going to mature a little bit more to understand it properly. Okay. Okay, so now Take any of those four books that I mentioned to you in the beginning or any other book of your choice. Take a look at some examples, read a little bit some notes, uh, and uh, get uh, acquainted again with the notion of, of uh, sigma algebras. Now, once we have these sets, so, so the sets in the sigma algebra are called, uh, so a remark, So the sets 
the sets in sigma, the sets in the sigma algebra are called sigma measurable sets. Okay? Or simply measurable. If the context is clear, whenever I say a measurable set, this will mean that I, ha I am talking about a sigma algebra and I'm talking about one of the sets in my sigma algebra. And you'll see that the name here is a little bit suggestive, right? Measu we call these measurable sets because these are the sets that ultimately we are going to try to measure. We are going to try to give them a size, okay? But before we do this, let me talk about our point number two of the day, since we already discussed what the sigma algebra is, let's talk about measurable functions. Aha. That's our topic two for the day. Now, I am going to, okay, so for my theory of integration, it will be sometimes convenient to allow my functions to take the values, you know, plus or minus infinity. Okay? Professor. Tell me. May I, uh, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, uh, in this remark, you say that the sets in sigma are called sigma measurable sets. Are you, uh, do we not have to assume an existence of function defined on that uh, sigma algebra that maps to the real numbers or something like that? Uh, to say something like that. Tell me again. Uh, do we do we not have to assume uh, a non-negative uh, real valued uh, function that is defined on this sigma algebra to say something like this to say that it is sigma measure it is a collection of sigma measurable sets. Well, I mean this this depends on. Uh your mood of the day. No, you can simply call, you know, yes, we are going to do this in a minute. We're going to define a measure on this set. We're going to try to, but uh, sometimes if you're just, uh, this is just a notation, right? Sometimes if you are, if you have a sigma algebra, you can call these guys the elements of the sigma algebra as you want. I'm just calling them measurable sets, okay? Uh, this is not a, it's not a big deal. Don't worry too much about it. Uh, uh, well, yes, so the way that I am defining a set is, it could be a measurable set, uh, even if you don't have a function taking values on the positive, non-negative real numbers associated to it, okay? So don't worry too much about it. Now, as I was saying, uh, my functions, our functions here in this course, it will be convenient for us to allow the functions to take the values plus or minus infinity. So whenever I use this notation, let's say r bar, I am going to be referring to what we call the extended real line, okay? which are the real numbers union the two symbols, plus infinity and minus infinity in the standard way. Okay, So you're going to adjoin the two infinities to your real line, and uh, you're going to make operations with these guys. Okay, so the operations, when you have the infinities, should, the operations should most of the time be clear to you, right? If you take your real number A, and you add with plus infinity, then this is plus infinity. If you take a real number A, which is positive, and you multiply by plus infinity, you get plus infinity. If you take, uh, I don't know, plus infinity, plus, plus infinity, this should be plus infinity, and so on. Okay, so most of the operations are very intuitive. They are what they should be. But of course, we have to be a bit careful. We have to be a bit careful when things like uh, plus infinity minus plus infinity appears. Or we have to be a bit careful when zero times 
plus infinity appear. So usually these are expressions that we are going to try to avoid as much as possible. But if not, we are going to define this in the particular situation that we have in mind. Let me move you. Okay. Okay, so now let me, let me say the following, okay. So the sets in sigma are called measurable sets. Uh, the pair, if you want, the pair omega with the sigma algebra is called, will be called for me a measurable space. Well, I think the camera is not moving. The what? The camera. It's uh, on the previous board. The... What is in the previous board? No, the camera wasn't moving to where you ah, were. Where is the camera? Everyone, camera is here with me now. Hello? Is the camera with me? Yes. No, it's... Uh... Okay. Okay, so I'm going to call a measurable space the, the my set sigma with uh, the sigma, my set omega with the sigma algebra sigma, and I'm going to say that a function, so let's, let's put here a definition. I'm going to give you a measurable space in the sense that we defined before, and I am going to say that Let's just say that a function f from omega, from your set, let's put to r, just first define it, function from omega to r, is said to be measurable if the Free image of intervals, free image of, say, any interval i is a measurable set. Okay. So my function from omega to r is going to be, I am defining Okay, it's going to be a measurable function if the pre-image of any interval is a measurable set. That is, the pre-image is sometimes denoted to by this f minus one of an interval i. This is the set of x in omega, such that f of x belongs to i. Okay, so for all intervals, if this belongs to my sigma algebra, this is what I'm saying. If this is the case, then my function is going to call, be called a measurable function. Uh, I is an interval, okay? So intervals for me are anything of the sort, uh, let's say, a, b. It could be a, b closed. It could be a closed, b. It could be closed or open intervals in uh, any of the endpoints, you could even have minus infinity a, minus infinity a, uh, let's say a, let's just use b for the second endpoint here, b, and then a plus infinity, and then a plus infinity. So intervals to me is anything of this form, where a and b are real numbers. So I'm talking about finite intervals or, or infinite intervals to one of the size, even actually minus infinity, infinity, why not? So these are all the possible intervals. Okay, you will see, wow, professor, but I see sometimes a definition in some books different from this. Well, that is true, but what happens is that you don't have to prove that the pre-image of all the intervals are measurable sets. From this definition, you can just restrict yourself to intervals, say, of this form, if you want, okay? So let me leave you 
this as, as your second exercise for the day, exercise two. Let me write it like this. Uh, show that it's sufficient. Show that it is sufficient to verify that the sets, to verify the definition, let's say, to verify the definition for intervals uh, of the type, let's say, A infinity. In other words, if the sets, uh, if the sets x belonging to omega, such that f of x is bigger than a, and then a, if this belong to the sigma algebra for all a real. Okay. This, uh, of course, uh, this, this particular type has nothing to do associated to it, so you could have, you could choose, you could choose uh, a infinity, if you prefer, you could choose minus infinity b, you could choose uh, minus infinity b, and so on. Okay, you could choose any of the others. So this is sometimes a definition that you will see in the books: that a measurable function is a function f such that the preimage, the points in omega such that f of x is bigger than a. This is a measurable set for all the real a's. Okay. Now, uh, so just, just to play in a little bit, so let's just play a bit how we would approach this exercise. I'm, as I said, I'm going to put this on your weekly homework. Uh, but how would you approach this? Well, I'm saying in the definition that the preimage of any interval should be measurable, okay? In particular, from this interval, okay? So this definition here implies this definition here, okay? If I call, let's call this, uh, Measurable type uh, star, a function such that the preimage of all of the intervals of this type is measurable. So this definition implies this one. Now, assume that you have now this, and I want to show that the preimage of any interval is also measurable. Okay, and then you have to play a little bit. So, so for example, what would be the preimage of an interval of the source, uh, say, minus infinity? B. Well, this preimage here would be just the wh who's mapped up to B. This would be the preimage of of uh, of uh, of uh, B infinity complement, right? So you know that from this definition here, this guy is in the sigma algebra. So the complement is also in the sigma algebra. So you already proved for the intervals of this sort, okay? And then this is what you do, and so on. Now, uh, how would you prove now, say, for, for the, so you prove that the preimage of the intervals of this form is okay. Now you use that the preimage of intervals minus infinity b, let's put it open on b, okay? This is just the union of f minus one minus infinity, say, b minus one over n closed when n is a natural number. So you will use tricks like this. You will approximate your b, b minus one over n, and you close here. Then you use, okay, the intervals of this size, of this type, are all in the sigma algebra. So the countable union it is. So intervals of this type it is. Then you take the complement, and so on. So you quickly, just starting from intervals of this type, you can some, somehow generate by countable unions and intersections and complements you can generate all the other intervals, okay? Play a little bit with this exercise. It's very nice and convince yourself that this is the same thing. And then, from now on, when we want to check that a function is measurable, you just take the, let's say for any alpha, prove that the set where f of x is bigger than alpha is a measurable set. You just take this, you can take this as our definition. Okay, now. A, well, this definition of measurable function properties, let's, let's just give some examples. 
Just to give some examples. Uh, for example, the basic one is that if, if a function is constant, well, if you have a constant function, this, this set here will either be empty or it will be the whole omega, which both, of course, belong to the sigma algebra. So this is okay. The second example is that if you take, so let E belong to omega. So take a set, take a set in your sigma, take a set in your sigma algebra, and, and consider what we call the characteristic function. So the characteristic function will be the function which we're going to denote key of the set E. That at the point X is going to be either one if your X belongs to the set E, or it's going to be zero if your X does not belong to the set E. Okay? So keep this notation we are going to use a lot in this course. You know, this, this letter key to denote the characteristic function of a set E is just zero or one is one according if my element belongs to the set and it's zero if my element does not belong to the set. Okay, so this is an example of a measurable function. Huh, this is an example of a measurable function. Let's, let's check. Let's check. Who is the pre-image? So give me an A, real number, who is the set of points in omega such that my f of x is bigger than a? Well, this, you will have uh, some possibilities, right? This is going to be, if a is negative, a is negative, everybody, because the values of my function are just one or zero, everybody's gonna be bigger than a. So this is gonna be the whole set, if a is negative, a is less than or equal to zero, right? Uh, but, 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 no. If A is negative, that's fine, because this is bigger than A. Now, what happens if A is zero? Who are the sets of points in omega such that my function is bigger than zero? Or if it's bigger than zero, then it has to be one, and the set is going to be E. This actually is okay, not only for zero, but from zero less than or equal than a less than one. And then if your a is bigger than one, if your a is bigger or equal than one, who's gonna be a point f such that f of x is going to be bigger or bigger than a? Then there will be no points, so this will be the empty set. Okay, so this, this level set here, this super level set where the function is bigger than a, has just three possibilities. Either is the whole thing, either is my E, which I'm assuming that it's measurable because I took it in the beginning, or it's going to be the empty set. In either possibility, it is a measurable set, so this function is always a measurable function. Okay? Uh, let's see. Another example. If you take, if you take a uh, p -p 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 continuous function, if you take a continuous function, continu continuous function f, let's say you're from, from, from Rd to R. Take me a continuous function from Rd to R. Uh, well, the pre-image of an interval, the pre-image of an open interval like this, if, mm -hmm. if, if you have this set here, the pre-image of an open interval like this is an open, open set. Interval. Yeah, because my function is continuous. So the pre-image of open sets is open. So the pre-image of an open interval like this is going to be an open set. 
So if I take, say, for example, the Borel with the Borel sigma algebra, I'm OK. If I take the Borel algebra, it's the algebra where the open sets belong to the sigma algebra. And then the continu continuous functions will be measurable. This is good because, you know, remember, we are aiming to develop a theory of integration. So the, 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 the measurable sets are somehow the sets that we're going to measure. We're going to try to put a measure there. We're going to measure their size. And the measurable functions are the functions which we're going to try to measure the integral of the function. right? So any reasonable theory, say if you are working on RD, would have to contain, for example, the continuous functions. Okay. Uh, Another example that you can have, so we just close the set of examples here, is that you can take functions, say, from R to R that are monotone. Functions from the real line to the real line that are monotone, too. Also with the Borel, with the Borel sigma algebra. Now, my function might have some discontinuities. It's monotone increasing or monotone decreasing. It may have some jumps. Uh, this function is also a measurable function. You can check directly from the definition because the pre-image of an interval like this will be an interval, too. Not necessarily an open interval, but it will be an interval. And then you can, uh, you can see it belongs to the Borel sigma algebra. OK. Now, it's a. Uh, well, as I said, the, these are the functions that we are going to try to define the integral. We're going to try to measure the integrals of these functions. And it serves our pur purposes if this class is, is a big class, right? We're going to try to measure, to define the integrals uh, of these guys. Uh, and the whole point of the, you know, this theory of integration that started with the work of Lebesgue was to extend the theory of integration developed by Riemann. You know, Riemann knew how to measure the integrals of functions that didn't have too many discontinuities by approaching the function by below. You take, remember, if everybody, if, if you can remember what you learned in calculus, right? how you compute the Riemann integral, right? You take a partition of the interval, you approximate the function by below and by above, and if these two things coincide when you refine the partition, you define that as a Riemann integral. And there are some functions uh, that can be integrated with this definition. You know? The function doesn't have to have, cannot have too many discontinuities. Let's just say this for now. Uh, and then later, Lebesgue developed, say, a more elegant way of, of, of doing the theory of integration that was not only more elegant, simpler, but also more, more robust. You, know? you can integrate more functions. All the functions that Riemann could integrate, Lebesgue can integrate and give the same result, but also you can integrate more functions. And, and so the first point for us is that with this definition of measurable functions, you know, functions from a set to R, we have to just check that we can do all sorts of possible reasonable operations with these things, you know. I would like to take a function and add up two measurable functions and still have a measurable function. I would like to take linear combinations. I would like to take the absolute value. I would like to multiply by a constant, multiply functions, divide when I can, and so on. You know? So this, this would be actually interesting. So let me leave this as uh, your next exercise for the day, is that you can actually do all sorts of reasonable operations with measurable functions. Let's say if f and g are measurable and c is a real number, then the functions 
let's say, multiplying by a constant. C times F is measurable. F plus G is measurable. F squared is measurable. F times G is measurable. An absolute value of F is measurable. Uh, if you want F plus, which is the maximum of F and zero, is measurable. And F minus, which is the uh, max of minus F and zero, is measurable. All of these are measurable. Okay? So you can take functions, you can add them up, you can multiply, you can take the absolute value, you can take the positive part, you can take the negative part. All of these are measurable functions if you start with measurable functions. And of course, you can iterate this. So if you have several functions, you can multiply them out, you can multiply by constants, you can take linear combinations, and so on. So our class that started uh, with a simple definition gets very big very quickly. You know, so it's, it's a vast class. So I'll leave this to you as an exercise for you to think about too. And again, this is the condition that needs to be checked, okay? Play a little bit around, try to prove the condition. Of course, multiplying by a constant is no big deal. Just check the definition. F plus G, you have to play a little bit. And then these other guys too. So this is an exercise for you to perhaps discuss with Andrea. And, uh, we use ra rational numbers. Tell me, I didn't understand. We use rational numbers, rational numbers to, sh to show uh, if plus g is a measurable function, to showing this, showing this. The difference, you mean? No, r r rational numbers, we use to sh showing uh, measurable of if plus g. Is mentioning using the density or rational number to prove the f plus g is measurable. Yeah, yeah. Or oh, you're asking how would I would prove that f plus g is measurable? No, I don't. I'm not sure I understand the question. Sorry, the the uh, sound here in the room is a bit uh, noisy. I I think he suggests suggestion uh, using the 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 rational numbers. In uh, this proof, I don't know how. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. No, you have to. You have to make the rational numbers. Some, some, some argument that I kind of uh, hinted right here. You have to make the rational numbers appear to make the countable unions of things, countable unions of sets, to use the properties of your sigma algebra. You're right. Okay, so you have to. This is a very interesting exercise. So, guys, <laughs> again. This will only work if you sit down and think about these exercises. I'm not assigning too many, but really the ones that I'm assigning are core for you to understand what's going on. So you really do have to sit down and convince yourself that this works, okay? I will talk about the homework. I have no uh, problem if you want to talk to your friends. You, you can do it in groups if you want. You can discuss with your friends, share, share the ideas. I, I just wanted that uh, each of you sit down and write your own solution. Don't copy the solution. You can discuss the ideas, you can discuss the proof, but to write your own solution and convince yourself that it's correct, that it works, you know. When it comes to turning the homeworks, you can discuss freely with your groups, you know. I actually encourage you to do so. I think you work much better as a team, you know. Uh, don't worry about the grade at the end of the course. You will not be evaluated on a relative basis, you know, A is better than B. I want to evaluate all of you in absolute terms. And you should actually think about this for the course and for the diploma program. You should, if, even for mathematics in general, do not think about it in relative terms. You know, oh, this person is doing better than me. What's my problem? No, think about absolute terms. Are you doing the best that you can? I am doing the best that I can. I mean, of course, you will find all. Everybody finds out somebody out there doing better than what they, they think they are doing. You know? So if you start, this is a good uh, uh, philosophy for you guys that are starting on mathematics, you know? looking into the future. Don't look at the whole thing in relative terms. Look at it in absolute terms. Do the best that you can 
because if you look at it in relative terms, that's a recipe for depression. Okay? <laughs> and this is in all levels, students, PhD students, postdoc, professors, you know, professors in the highest level always find other professors that they think are doing better than what they are doing. So you don't have to think about this. Uh, okay, so where were we? Uh, okay, now, uh, okay, are we clear up to now? Any more questions? All right. So, so I have defined what are measurable functions for a function taking values on R. Okay, so my functions up to now are functions taking real values, not for a moment, not plus infinity or minus infinity. This is why I didn't bother to here. I am okay to multiply by any number. I'm okay to add up two things. Okay, so I didn't worry too much about it. Now let's make some minor adjustments if we wanted our functions to take the values in the extended real line. Let's see what would happen. And the definition is going to be the same. So I'm saying a function f from omega to r extended is said to be measurable if the pre-image of any, now I'm going to put any extended interval i is a measurable set, okay? And an extended interval i, I will include the intervals, I will include the intervals that contain or not the plus and minus infinity. So you'd have to include in the list of extended intervals the, the things that uh, include the minus infinity up to b, include the minus infinity up to b closed, and then a to infinity closed here, and then a to infinity closed here. And of course, the, the minus infinity, okay. So you have the, the, the four possible variations of this, the open here and closed here, open here and closed here, and that both closed. Three more, okay? So you, these are the extended intervals. So this is the same definition. And again, you can have the exercise two prime which is show that it's sufficient to verify the definition for the intervals of the type blah, A infinity. The same thing applies, okay, for the same thing applies for extended functions. My point is, my remark that exercise two still applies. or functions, for measurable functions from f, f from omega to the extended line, okay? In, in other words, you can actually use this as your definition, okay? You can actually use this as your definition. So the, the, when the pre-image, when the set for any a, real number, the set where f of x is bigger than a is measurable, this function is going to be called a measurable function. Okay, take a look at this. Uh, well, let me make a few comments on this. A few comments. So, for example, assume that your function f omega to r plus is a measurable function, okay? And uh, you want to find the set of points f minus 1 of the point plus infinity. So, so this is the set of points 
x in omega such that f of x is equal to plus infinity. Well, this is, if f of x is infinity, so this is the union where n is bigger than 1 of the sets, or maybe not the union, but the intersection. Intersection. Uh, where f of x is bigger than n. Okay? And then you're okay, because from your definition, all of these sets where f of x is bigger than any natural number n, this is a measurable set, a countable intersection. We have seen that it's a measurable set. So this set here, the pre-image of the point infinity, is measurable. Okay. Similarly, you can prove that f minus 1, the pre-image of the point minus infinity, is also measurable. Okay, so as an example, and you can try this, so since, since the pre-image of infinity is a measurable set and the pre-image of minus infinity is a, is a measurable set, um, uh, you could modify your functions at these sets if you wanted to. For example, if we consider if we consider a function, let's call it uh, f bar of x, which is going to be uh, f of x if f of x is not plus or minus infinity. And if, if f is plus or minus infinity, I'm going to baptize f bar to be 0 if f of x is equal to plus or minus infinity. So you can define these new functions where you take your original f and for those points for which your original f was given plus infinity or minus infinity, you're changing it to zero. And you're constructing this function f bar. And my claim is that f bar is also measurable. So this implies that f bar is also measurable. Verify this. So, uh, so now my claim is that uh, this exercise three still holds, exercise three still holds for, uh, for functions taking values in the extended real line. Okay, or f and g taking values on the extended real line. Uh, so if you take two functions with two extended functions, two, two functions taking values in the extended real line, they are measurable, and you take a constant, you can multiply and you get still a measurable function, you can add them up, you can square, you can multiply, uh, you can take the absolute value, you can take the positive part and the negative part, all of these are going to be measurable. Now you have to, well, you may have trouble in defining these things. So what is, if f takes the value plus infinity and if g takes the value minus infinity, what's the sum? If c is 0 and f is taking the value plus infinity, what's the product of 0 and plus infinity? So I'm going to say that exercise 3 still holds for two functions f and g if we define we have to make a definition here. If you define, uh, for instance, for the purpose of this exercise, if we define uh, 0 times plus minus infinity to be 0, and if we defined plus infinity, uh, let's say plus or minus infinity minus the same thing, well, this is. Uh, let me write it, the two things. So plus infinity plus minus infinity to be 0. If I define it like this, then the exercise holds, OK? So I can, I can, 
for these purposes. For now, if you want to take a look at this exercise for two extended functions, you make these definitions. And then this is well-defined, this is well-defined, this is well-defined. These are all functions. And now you can prove that these functions are measurable. Okay. Now, before we close for today, we are very close to, to the end. Um, so what's the advantage of working with the extended real line? Why, professor, why can't we just work with the real numbers? You're putting infinity, it's going to make me crazy. Uh, I don't like to work with plus minus infinity. Well, we're going to have to. And the reason is because we want to discuss a lot about convergence theorems, right? So every sequence of real numbers, every sequence of real numbers that is bounded, say if, if you have a monotone sequence that it's bounded, has an upper bound, then it will have a limit, which is a real number. Right? But if you just tell me, OK, take a sequence of real numbers that it's monotone, but not necessarily bounded. So if you take a sequence that is monotonely increasing, uh, and you ask, what's the limit? What's the supremum of this sequence? It may not be a real number. It may be infinity. So for example, if you take the sequence of the natural numbers, what's the limit of this sequence? Well, you're all acquainted, you're all used to say that the limit of n, when n goes to infinity, is infinity. Right? But by making infinity one of our numbers, we are essentially saying that in the extended real line, all the monotone sequences have a limit in this extended real line. And this is important for us, because now, we can define a soup inf of sequences of functions. And let me perhaps state the last thing that I wanted to measure to say to you today. Well, you can define uh, this. So this is the last, my last exercise for you today, exercise four. Now, if fn n bigger or equal than one, is a sequence of measurable functions. And I say taking values on R plus, on R bar, taking values on the extended real numbers. You, you can take it taking real values if you want, but you can allow it to take values on the extended real line. Then, on top of multiplication by constant, uh, taking linear combinations, multiplication of functions, taking the absolute value, you can also take limits of sequences of functions. So if you take a sequence of, of measurable functions, then the following functions, let's call it g1 of x, which is the infimum over n of fn of x, this function defined like this, OK? g2 of x, which is the function defined as the soup over n, fn of x. g3 of x, which is the lim inf over n of fn of x. And the function g4, which is the lim soup over n of fn of x, they are all measurable. OK? Now, pay attention, right? So for each point x, I am defining the function g1 of x as the infimum of the sequence fn of x. So this is just a sequence of numbers in the extended real line. So the infimum of uh, some numbers in the extended real line is always attained in this extended real line. It could be minus infinity. Same thing for the soup here. So for any fixed x, g3 of x is the limit of the sequence of numbers of fn of x. So you have to, if you don't know it yet or if you forgot, take a look at the definition and basic properties of working with sequences, lim, inf, lim, soup, what's the inf, what's the soup, of, what's the limit, upper bounds, lower bounds, and so on. We are going to be using this a lot here. Okay. And this is also 
something that does not take us out of the class of measurable functions. Okay? Uh, I, we had to define things on this, on this uh, extended real life because even if you take functions, a sequence fn of functions which take real values, these things here, the, the sup, the lim inf, the lim sup could be infinity. So these functions, g1, g2, g3, g4, would not necessarily live in the real numbers. And so for us not to break the theory because of a technicality like this, it's just better to, to put these guys into play right now. OK? OK, so uh, I think this is a good point for us to stop today. I would start talking about measures today, but I'll leave it for next class. So I think this was OK for the first class. You already got the feeling of what's going to go on here. The beginning will be a bit of uh, sort of a review, but a uh, slightly fast-paced review of measure theory. I'm leaving some of the statements that I think are good exercises that would take me time to solve here uh, for you to try at home. You should really you know, complete the theory that I'm trying to develop here, because this is your part to do. I mean, we cannot move on if you do not convince yourselves that this, this, these propositions are, are OK. And uh, this is morally the path that we're going to follow. You guys, you know, over the next class, over the next week, you give me some feedback also to see how you are feeling. You know, professor, this is too slow, or professor, this is too fast, this is too hard, this is too easy. I'll gather your feedback, and we can, of course, accord you can, we can adjust accordingly, okay? But I think this is a good pace for us to move on. Maybe I'm wrong. So you tell me if I am a bit uh, too much on one side, too much on the other side, and then we're going to adjust and everybody's going to profit from this. Is that okay? All right, guys. Now you go to work. We meet again this Thursday at 11, okay? This is the time of our class, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11 in this hall. Maybe next week you guys will already be here. Okay, so we're going to finish for today. Thank you all for the attention. If you have any questions, just shoot me an email or to Andrea. She'll be getting in contact with you sometime soon to schedule the tutorials, okay? Okay, thank um, you. Professor, what uh, will you be